A while ago I made a video that compared object-oriented and functional programming. It was very popular and I got a lot of feedback, some of it pointing out the error of my ways. One of the common pieces of feedback was that I was missing the real point. The real point isn't functional programming versus OO programming, it's declarative versus imperative. These are two very different ways of programming. Or are they really? Is this a difference in paradigm or just about syntactic sugar? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors. Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, Specflow and Linode. They've all been supporting our channel. I've been saying that for a year now. Uh, and during that time, the channel has grown significantly. My sponsors have been fantastic in helping me to be able to do this. I selected them with some degree of care. They're all company whose products and services complement the ideas on this channel. Harness and Equal Experts were my first two sponsors and each has now been supporting this channel for over a year. Harness create cloud-based continuous delivery tools that make many of the ideas that I discuss here much easier. Equal Experts is a consultancy. They use many of the techniques that I recommend here to make a real difference for their clients. Please do check out their links and please do thank them for their support of this channel. The links are in the description below. In this episode, I want to explore the ideas of declarative versus imperative programming. I should probably begin by saying that I don't think this is an us versus them kind of thing. I think that we all do a bit of both. One of the other ideas that I want to explore today is something that I've noticed in a variety of different cases. This idea is kind of fractal. It's most commonly discussed and thought of in the context of programming languages. But I think there's more to it than that. I'll try and explain what I mean by that later on in the video. Let's start with some definitions. The easy one is imperative programming. This is probably where most programmers begin their programming careers. Let's imagine that we're going to write some code to solve Wordle problems. Probably one of the first things that's likely to be helpful to us is to have a list of possible five letter words. So let's write a function that given a list of words returns a list of five letter words. Pretty simple, but I am a test-driven development nerd, so I'm definitely going to start this by writing a test first. So here it is. Here's the simple solution that makes my test pass. This is pretty easy code to read. Essentially, what makes this imperative is that it describes a sequence of steps that are required to solve the problem. A sequence of instructions to the computer telling it what to do and the order to do it in. Let's look at a declarative version of the same function. Here's my new test, no difference at all. Here's my code. In case you aren't familiar with this style, what this says is filter this dictionary full of words and select those of length five. Clearly, this is less code, which may or may not be a good thing. I think that if you are optimizing to reduce typing in your coding, you're optimizing the wrong thing. Less typing is certainly good, but not if it comes at the cost of clarity. Software is meant to communicate to other people first, and only to computers after that. I prefer to optimise to reduce thinking rather than to reduce typing. Which means that it's not the characters that I'm really counting the cost of. It's something trickier to enumerate. It's more to do with the cognitive load. How hard does this code make me think? In both of these cases, the cognitive load is pretty low. I've spent the majority of my career working in languages that other people would certainly describe as imperative. So I certainly have a bias. But even at this trivial level, I think that comparing these two versions of the same thing by counting characters is too simplistic. I think that the cognitive load of the declarative version is very slightly higher. 
In this case, it's not enough to bother me. I'd be perfectly happy to use either one of these two versions, and I'd probably pick the declarative one for this task. But let me dissect this to see what I mean. How many ideas do I need to understand to understand each piece of code? There's some common stuff in here, like functions and parameters for both cases, but the advantage that the imperative style has is that it describes how the problem is solved. There's less implicit knowledge, the workings are more exposed. And that translates, in this case, fairly easily to natural language. For each word in a dictionary, if the word is five characters long, append the word to my words list. It's not that you don't need to know stuff to read this, but most of the stuff that you need to know, you probably already know before you learn how to program. It's English and algebra. I'd argue that the idea of a lambda a small anonymous function is a more complex idea to grasp. It's not insurmountable, but it's not what you learn on day one of your programming course either. The cognitive load for lambdas is just a little bit higher. You can certainly do the same exercise, and if you know to ignore the word lambda, in other languages, odds constructs involving stuff that looks a bit like an arrow, perhaps, it reads pretty well. But I had to add more words to make it read sensibly here. So that is tacit knowledge that I'm adding to my interpretation of this code. So it seems just a tiny bit more cryptic to me. It's a quirk of Python, but I was certainly pleased that I wrote a test first when I wrote this code, because when I did write it, the first time I ran my test, it failed. That's because I forgot that what I got from a filter was an iterator, not a list. So, I, so to make my code work, I had to surround the filter with a list. Again, not a very big deal, but it's also not transparently obvious. I realised my mistake as soon as the test failed, but that's another little, not necessarily obvious bit of syntax. Another tiny little tick up in the cognitive load. You may argue, and you are probably right, that this is just reflecting my bias from years of imperative programming, but I think that there is a bit more to it than that. One of the big advantages of the declarative style is that we can write more generic code. I assume that most of us um, can see how we would implement a version of filter for ourselves. It's a pretty trivial function, even if you write it in an imperative language. Even if you write it in a language like function pointers or lambdas, it's pretty easy. You can always use polymorphism instead, an interface or similar, to get the same result. My point is that some of the language constructs, useful as they undoubtedly may be, don't allow us to do anything that we couldn't already do. The syntax sugar just makes it easier and nicer to do those things. I've written functions like this hundreds of times during the course of my career, but in this case you don't have to because filter is part of Python, and it lets you filter any collection, actually any iterable thing with any function that describes the filter criteria and returns true or false. Once you've learned the concepts, the additional cognitive load is not really noticeable, and it's extremely flexible and works in a lot of circumstances. I have no problem at all with the value of language features like filter. My reservation is that I get a little bit more nervous when declarative systems get lots more complex than this. There's a cost to abstraction and generality. Everything in software is a trade-off, after all, and the risk in over-abstracting or over-generalizing things is a lack of clarity because things are so abstract. Just to make my point, these language constructs are completely general, but they don't tell you anything at all about what I'm doing. There's another problem here, though, and this is more nuanced. The definitions we use for imperative or declarative aren't actually very precise. Wikipedia defines declarative languages in part like this. They express the logic of a computation without describing its control flow. So filter describes what we want without saying how we get it. Cool. But hang on, doesn't append in the imperative version do the same thing? We don't know and don't care how the append happens. We only know that when it's finished appending, 
the thing we appended is just at the end of the list. When filter is finished filtering, we know that we have a list of things that match the criteria we set. How is this any different? The definition of imperative programming says this. It uses statements that change a program's state. Aha! I hear all the functional programmers cry in the back row. Our code is immutable. Well, sure, your functions may be, but your program isn't. After the filter, the state of my program has changed. I now have a list of five letter words that I didn't have before. So no difference here either. At the level of programming language, I'm not convinced that the differences are as big as we make them out to be. There are differences and different programming paradigms can help us to think about problems in different ways. But I'm an old school assembler programmer and it all turns out into opcodes in numbers in registers in the end. I was a bit sneaky in setting up my examples though. There is an aspect of declarative programming that I use all of the time. Declarative programming is completely central to the way that I write code, whatever the language that I'm writing it in. But for me, the value is less about language constructs. My version of declarative programming is at a different level of abstraction, really. I began my examples with some tests. Here they are again. They are the same. They are identical, except for the name of the function being tested. I could easily abstract that and use the same test for both cases if I wanted to. The important differentiator between imperative and declarative for me is that I aim to declare the outcomes that I expect my code to deliver rather than the algorithms that will give me those outcomes. This is at the heart of how I practice test driven development but it also deeply informs how I write other code too. I want my code to clearly express its objectives as far as I'm able to achieve that. My code is usually pretty easy to read in small pieces because it describes the outcomes that it's seeking. I wouldn't really call a method declarative words. It'd probably be something like five letter words. That's declaring an outcome. My preferred approach to software development is to drive it from executable specifications. We start any new piece of work by thinking of an example that demonstrates that the new feature that we want exists, and then we create an automated test to verify that example. This is our executable specification. We then develop our code until this test passes. By far the best way to do this is to focus only on the outcome and completely ignore the implementation detail when we're trying to construct these examples and tests. We declare the desirable behavior of our system and just like the filter example, our declaration, our specification here is generic. It says nothing about how the system works. It defines what we want without saying anything about how we get it. In fact, my goal in how I design my code is always to hide implementation detail at every level until the implementation detail is so simple that it's obvious what's going on. This, I think, is the real value of a declarative approach. It can come at, at a cost. In a declarative language, the layers of code that infer the solution may be more complex. Not always, but maybe. But the definition is pretty much always more generic. I think that this value has relatively little to do with the programming languages though, and much more to do with design. If you'll forgive me for talking about my own history briefly, I have an example that I think is relevant. In the early 1990s, I worked for a research company called Integrated Object Systems. We were developing a product called NUI, which stood for New World Infrastructure. The ambitious idea then was to demonstrate what programming would look like in the far future of the year 2000 and make products that made that a reality. This was based on something that we called cooperative business objects, which could communicate via messaging. Um, based on something that we called SDS for semantic data service, which predated XML and JSON but was conceptually the same. Tagged arbitrarily structured data but with some simple rules for the structuring. These days what we call co cooperative business objects would probably be called microservices. They were independently deployable and isolated from one another. But we also defined a simple but very generic protocol for the messages. This stuff 
is still the most flexible software that I've ever seen. You could introduce two independently developed objects to one another and have them collaborate and do useful work in unplanned ways. I could drag and drop a customer object onto a phone object and as long as the customer object had a phone number somewhere it would dial the number. I could drop the same customer into storage and that would be saved on, or onto a teleport point and it would be communicated to another location where it would be run. All of this is true even though all of these pieces were written in ignorance of the others. This was possible because the protocol and messaging was wholly declarative. This was so flexible that you could even build systems without writing any code. I built a system that would query a cooperative business object for its contents and then automatically generate a simple user interface to view and interact with that object. The declarative model provided enough structure to allow this kind of standardization. Whatever the nature of the object, we could do some basic useful work with it. I think this is where declarative systems really shine. They are often slower and debugging them can be complicated because there's a lot going on under the covers that you probably need to understand when things start to go wrong. I'm not really sure that I'm very convinced by the idea that the programming model in declarative languages is simpler for real world levels of complexity. It may be, but that isn't my impression looking at the code bases that are more complex than the simple kinds of examples that I've used here. But it does allow us to build and think at higher levels of abstraction, and that can have real value. I think that in this debate, my problem is that ultimately I am more of a design guy than a language guy. I think that the shapes that we cut with our software are much more important than the languages that we use to cut them. I've worked on projects that built advanced OO systems in COBOL and the fairly advanced declarative system that was NUI was built in C. Actually both of these were different implementations of the same system. Language matters less than design for me. And many of the concepts that we often argue about in terms of language are really just different patterns of use, different designs that you can apply in any language. After all, they're all general purpose languages in the end. Thank you very much for watching.